In this video, we're going to talk about David Hume and his famous arguments regarding the problem of induction. So we're going to be looking at excerpts from his inquiry concerning human understanding, sections four and five. Now, here are three portraits we have of David Hume, who lived in the 18th century, arguably the greatest philosopher who ever wrote in the English language. And this is perhaps his most famous and well-known argument. Here's the big idea. Um, in ordinary life and science, we typically conclude from past observations that similar events are going to stand in similar causal relationships with one another. When we make that kind of conclusion, we're making an inductive inference. Now, that's a term that Hume doesn't use, but that's what we commonly refer to these inference as today. So here's an example. In all past observations, dropped objects have descended towards the center of the Earth with the acceleration rate of about 9.8 meters per second squared. Therefore, in all cases whatsoever, even the ones that haven't happened yet or the ones that nobody ever observed, we can safely assume that dropped objects descend towards the center of the Earth with the acceleration rate of about 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, Hume's basic insight is this. All of those kinds of inductive inferences presuppose that events always happen the same way. Unobserved events happen the same way as observed events. But Hume points out that there is no good argument possible for that assumption. And that seems to raise a skeptical concern about whether these inferences on which all of life and science appear to be built are actually justified. All right, now Hume gets at this in his own distinctive way. So I'm going to walk you through the text uh, and explain his terms and his lines of argument for, uh, for this uh, position. And we begin with uh, a distinction that's become known as Hume's fork. Hume says, all the objects of human reason or inquiry may naturally be divided into two kinds, to wit, relations of ideas and matters of fact. So he wants to say all the things that we can reason about fall into one of these two categories. Now, let me explain what each of these terms mean for Hume, relations of ideas and matters of fact. Let me begin with relations of ideas. When Hume talks about relations of ideas, he really means necessary truths that can't conceivably be false. These are propositions whose truth doesn't even depend on what exists in the actual world. For example, the truths of geometry or algebra or arithmetic, these are relations of ideas. Take, for example, the Pythagorean theorem, which describes the relationships between the sides of a triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now, the Pythagorean theorem is true even if there are no actual triangles in the world. Just the mere idea of what a triangle is entails the truth of the Pythagorean theorem. So it expresses a relation between ideas. Or for example, uh, a simpler mathematical truth, like three, five, three times five is equal to 30 divided by two. That simply expresses the relationship between the ideas of these numbers. So according to Hume, you know relations between ideas simply through intuition. That is, when you think about the two ideas, you just see a certain relationship that holds between them. Or you can also know relations of ideas through what he calls demonstrative reasoning. By that, he simply means what we would call deductive reasoning about our ideas. It essentially involves like a chain of intuitions about, about the constituent ideas. So that's what relations of ideas are. Now, what are matters of fact? Well, matters of fact are not necessary truths. They are truths that could conceivably be false. They could have been otherwise. The truth value of a claim about some matter of fact depends on what actually exists in the world. So for example, if I say the sun will rise tomorrow, well, that's true 
just in case the sun actually does rise tomorrow. Otherwise, it would be false. Or if I say the sun will not rise tomorrow, again, that, that's true or false depending on what actually happens in the world. All of those distinctions are just meant to set up Hume's question. And here's his question that he wants to address in section four of the inquiry. What is the nature of that evidence which assures us of any real existence and matter of fact that goes beyond present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory? In other words, Knowing relationships between ideas is easy. We can do that by intuition or demonstration. But how do we come to know matters of fact, specifically those matters of fact which we aren't currently observing and that we don't have any memory of? For example, matters of fact about whether the sun is going to rise tomorrow or about if I'm inside in a windowless room, whether or not the sun is still out right now. Um, or whether it's exploded in the sky and no longer exists. How do we know that kind of stuff? And he, he pursues this question through, through a series of uh, related sub-questions. So in part one of section four, he, he, uh, which is entitled Skeptical Doubts, he asked this question. How do you know any particular unobserved matter of fact that you think you do know? For example, let's say you've got a barrel of gunpowder. How do you know that that barrel of gunpowder will explode when it is ignited with a match? Ask yourself that. And if you do ask yourself that, as Hume does, you might answer to yourself this way. Well, I know that's gonna explode because I know the causal relationship between this matter of fact that I can see gunpowder is being lit and an unobserved matter of fact, which I'm going to see in a second, and that is an explosion. In other words, you know that the gunpowder is going to explode because you know that lighting gunpowder causes explosions, and you know the gunpowder is currently being lit, and therefore you know that an explosion is going to occur. In other words, how do you know unobserved matters of fact? Because you know the causal relationship between those unobserved facts and ones that you do observe. Now, Hume thinks that this account of how we know unobserved facts is going to be uncontroversial. He thinks that if you think about it long enough, you'll agree with them. So, so far, he hasn't raised a skeptical problem. He's just describing what he takes our, our common way of thinking to be. And he gives us some further examples. Why, for example, do you believe that your friend is currently in France? Well, and the answer might be that you got a letter from your friend with uh, what appears to be your friend's signature and dated a uh, date in, in your friend's handwriting. And you infer this letter, including its signature and date, was caused by my friend. Why? Because you know what causes handwriting that looks like this? Oh, it's my friend who does that. Okay, so you know the causal relationship between the letter you've got and the friend you don't see. And on that basis, you can infer where your friend is. Or maybe, you know, because you remember hearing him say this, that your friend intended to go to France. And you infer based on that, well, my friend's intention probably caused him to actually go to France. The effect of his resolution was that he went to France. So again, you know where he is because you know about the causal relationship between something you remember and something that you don't currently observe. Or why do you believe that there were once men on this deserted island? Well, you find a watch, let's say, and you know that the cause of that watch's being there has got to be that some human brought it there. You know what causes things like that, watches. Um, or you hear a, a voice in the dark saying words, and you infer that there's another human there in the dark because articulate voices are caused by humans. Now, sometimes uh, the causal chain that affords us these inferences is a little bit more complicated. For example, um, let's say you see a fire burning in the distance. Uh, you and you infer that there is, there is heat near that fire. Why is that? Well, because you know that um, 
if you see this light, there is going to be a fire there. And you know that fire also causes heat as well as light. So that's a collateral causal relationship. Both of those uh, effects, one of which you see, is caused by fire. All of this is just to convince you that this is the way we normally figure stuff out that we don't currently observe or remember. Now, here's what the next question is that he wants to pose to us. How do we know what the causal relationships between things are? And he thinks that the first thing we want to say here is that we don't know what the causal relationships between any two things are unless we've observed similar cases. Now, he uses a technical term. He says we don't know causal relationships a priori. A priori just means prior to observation. He says no matter how much you know about gunpowder and how much you know about fire, you won't be able to figure out what they are going to produce when they mix before you have seen it happen at least once. He says, I know the causal relationship or what's caused by um, you know, this kind of event only on the basis of similar causal relationships I've observed in the past. That is, other times I have uh, touched gunpowder with matches, there's been an explosion, right? So past observation is what informs me of causal relationships. And there's no other way to figure out a causal relationship, says Hume. Now, he thinks that it may be hard to convince you of this. There may be cases where you think, no, 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 no. I, I could have figured out what this was going to produce, even if I'd never seen anything like it before. For example, I would know, even if I'd never um, tried it before, that if I submerge my face in water, I'm going to drown, and I would never do it. He wants to say, no, you wouldn't. You couldn't possibly have. No matter how much you know about water, right down to the chemical molecular structure, and no matter how much you know about the human lung, right down to the molecules, you would not know what happens when humans are submerged in water until you've seen it happen. You wouldn't know what chemical reactions would happen uh, that would eventually cause drowning unless you'd seen the same thing happen before. You wouldn't know what fire was going to do when you stuck your hand in it or you stuck anything in it unless you had seen fire burn stuff up before. Um, you wouldn't know that magnets were going to resist or attract unless you had seen that kind of object do that kind of thing before. And you wouldn't know uh, whether milk and bread was gonna nourish humans or nourish tigers or both or neither. Again, unless you had seen that kind of thing happen before. We only know causal relationships based on past experiences, Hume wants to say. Now, so far, that's not a skeptical problem, but he's going to lead us to a skeptical problem in part two, which I will discuss in the next video.